Hello and welcome into the 24-7 Sports Football Recruiting Podcast. I'm National Recruiting Analyst Cooper Patek alongside 24-7 Sports Director of Scouting Andrew Ivins. And it's a, another crazy day in the world of college football. we got a loaded show for you today. The Transaction Wire, what does that mean? Everything that's happening in all the college football recruiting world, commitments, decommitments, Auburn hot on the trail right now. Florida leaking a little bit. Two big games for Billy Napier to finish out the season. Also, we'll get a Mike Roach, who a lot of people like to call Papa Roach. We'll get a vibe check down there in Texas from our guy, Mike Roach. But first, Drew, I believe you have one little thing. Yeah, I do, Cooper. One little thing, starting it off. Give me all of the Dante Moore saga drama if this thing happens, right? Tracy Pearson of Bruin Sports Online of the 24-7 Sports Network. He reports on Monday that Chip Kelly is likely out at UCLA. And Cooper, we were texting about it last night, right? What does this mean for Dante Moore? And to give some context here, Dante Moore, our number three quarterback in the 2023 cycle, he's played uh, in eight games as a true freshman for the Bruins, started five of them, uh, posted a three and two record with the two losses coming to Utah and Oregon State. Both those were ranked opponents. I think it was a bit of a difficult situation. When you look at Dante Moore, he has been sacked 19 times this year. Seven of those sacks came against the Utes. I mean, that's a difficult outing for any quarterback, let alone a true freshman. And Cooper, man, if, if, if Chip Kelly is on the market, I think everyone is going to be looking at Dante Moore from coast to coast. Let's go back to his recruitment. Like I said, was committed to Oregon. He took visits everywhere around the country, Texas A&M, Michigan State, Michigan, Miami, LSU, the list goes on and on. So I think if Dante Moore were to enter the transfer portal, it's going to get crazy in December just in terms of who wants to get involved. Lots of schools need a quarterback. And I'll leave you with this nugget on Dante. I go back to the All-American Bowl last year uh, after Dante had signed with UCLA. It was in between reps. I was kind of talking with him. I said, hey, man, like, how did that whole interaction with UCLA uh, go down? He said he actually is the one that reached out to the Bruins, right? He contacted them. Next day, Chip Kelly was in home for an in-home visit. Uh, and then he ended up signing with UCLA. In hindsight, seems like a little weird marriage there in Los Angeles. Yeah, less than a year later, here we are. Dante Moore could potentially be back on the move. We'll see what happens with Chip Kelly. The report that you alluded to from Bruins 247, that Chip Kelly more than likely is out at the end of this season at UCLA. Drew, I went back. I watched three games of Dante Moore this year. Washington State, Oregon State, and Utah. You mentioned it. Sacked 17 time, or seven times against the Utes. Started that game off with a pick six. Drew, I, I have no questions when it comes to Dante Moore and the talent there. I think this is going to be a guy that will thrive in the right environment. I thought too many times this season he probably played with his food a little bit too much, and they put too much on his shoulders. Dealt with a lot of interior pressure, especially off the left side all season. But I think this is a guy from a talent standpoint. The flashes were consistent. It continues to show up. I think he's got to be better with his decision-making, not try to force things. But, Drew, you mentioned it, a couple names that kind of make sense if Dante Moore does test the portal. How about Oregon and Dan Lanning, right? Post-life after Bo Nix, we'll see what happens there. Ty Thompson, a guy that was highly regarded coming out of high school. We'll see. We haven't seen a lot of reps from him, live reps on the field. Outside of that, how about Notre Dame? Notre Dame was also a team that was yeah. very involved with Dante Moore in the recruiting process. I think a lot of people thought that that's where he was going to end up when Tommy Reese was the offensive coordinator over there. Kind of pivots late, commits to Oregon, ends up at UCLA. Drew, I think it goes without saying if he enters the portal, regardless of a 3-2 and two record as a starter and some of these blemishes that you can look at statistically, I think he's going to be one of the top five hottest names in the portal without a doubt. Well, absolutely. I mean, would any quarterback that was thrown into that situation have a better record than Dante Moore? I mean, you go through the throws on PFF. I mean, there are some dimes in there. I have no questions, like you said, about Dante Moore, we ranked him where he did because we believe in him. He was 40 and 11 as a four year starter at Detroit Martin Luther King High School, won a pair of state titles, also played for another state title, 
had a ton of exposure to this kid on the seven on seven circuit, the camp circuit. He is a competitor, right? He played for Cam Newton's team at the OT seven finals a few years ago because he wanted to learn from Cam, a, a guy that was an NFL quarterback, a guy that has done it before. Uh, so I believe in Dante more. I think the fact that he got his feet wet as a freshman, I mean, I, to me, that, that, that is what you want as an offensive coordinator. He's going to have a chance to step in and compete for a job wherever he goes. Remember, when he was committed to Oregon, it was Kenny Dillingham, now the head coach at Arizona State. That's kind of one of the reasons why he opened things back up. But it seems like he has ties to schools around the country. Again, he has visited a ton of different places. I think you could just pick a school and it would make sense for Dante Moore uh, to potentially look at them. Buckle up. Crazy couple weeks of college football coming up here December 4th. We'll have the transfer portal Palooza. Also December 20th, early National Signing Day. We'll just call that National Signing Day around here. And what better place to follow all of that than right here on the 24-7 Sports YouTube channel, especially with the Football Recruiting Podcast with Andrew Ivins and myself, Cooper Patagna, every Tuesday, Wednesday, 5 o'clock Eastern Time. You can find us on the 24-7 Sports YouTube channel, also wherever you find your podcasts as well. All right, Drew, let's get into the transaction wire. That's what we're going to call it, commitments, decommitments, coaches getting let go, coaches getting hired. That's where you can find it. Let's start with the Auburn Tigers, Drew. It seems like this is Hugh Freeze's time of year. The closer you get to December, the closer you get to putting pen to paper. Hugh Freeze gets hot. Right now, Auburn has the number 16 ranked recruiting class, and it helps when you flip a guy like top 247 edge, Jamonte Waller, out of the state of Mississippi from Billy Napier in the Florida Gators. Auburn seizing right now all the opportunity and momentum that they can. You also add in 2025 top 247 tight end, Ryan Gia. Number 234 in the top 247, number 12 tight end from Milton High School in Georgia. Drew Auburn right now, team to watch. You mentioned last year. How about this? Top 247 edge, Keldrick Falk, a guy they flipped from Florida State. Connor Liu, the interior offensive lineman, the center, who has played a lot of snaps for him this season from Miami. And Kay and Lee from Ohio State. Those aren't named, those aren't programs that are just out there that were, hey, we got to hang on to these guys. Those are three really prominent programs in the country. Auburn right now, Drew, like I said earlier, it just seems to kind of be like this is their time. They seem to be a team to watch over the next couple of weeks. Well, I would say, is there a more dangerous school to watch down the stretch? I mean, maybe there's a few others out there, but I got my eye on Auburn, and I've been saying that really since the summer months. I mean, they've had their coals in the fire with a number of different guys. Saturday night, they go ahead and flip Jamonte Waller. I think the Gators are about to kick off there in LSU. I was wonder, wonder how Billy Napier and his staff found out that they lost the pass rusher. Look, Jamonte Waller, this is a guy who can get after the quarterback. He's kind of got tweener measurables, but we saw him at the Under Armour camp in Atlanta. Once he changed directions, bended when coming around the corner, he's a guy that we really like, and he's someone I think could get on the field early on the planes just as a pass rusher in certain situations. So that's a monster pickup. And then, Coop, the other interesting thing, Jason Caldwell from our Auburn 247 site, he wrote earlier this week that there's a, there's a few other five stars Auburn's, you know, tracking here down the stretch. Cam Coleman, the in-state wide receiver who's committed to Texas A&M, he's one you got to keep an eye on. L.J. McCray, the five-star defensive lineman, he took a visit over the weekend to FSU. We know what Florida is going through right now. We're going to talk to them uh, about them later in the show. And then Jeremiah Beeman, another guy from the Yellowhammer State. Uh, and there's a few more out there. So I'm excited to see what Auburn can do. Hugh Freeze right now, 6-4. and four. I got a game coming up this weekend against New Mexico State. You move to 7-4. and four. And then you got the Iron Bowl against Alabama. Who knows what's going to happen there. But if you could say Hugh Freeze, year one, 7-5, and five, right? That's a ton of momentum. And I think every Auburn fan would be fired up about the direction the program is headed. I think that's, again, going to give them plenty of momentum on the recruiting trail and then also in that transfer portal. I'm not even going to discount them against Alabama. That's a crazy rivalry. We've seen crazy things happen there, but I agree with you. Opportunity to get to eight for Hugh Freeze after everything that program has kind of been through under Brian Harson in the last two years would be a huge win for Hugh Freeze. Drew, not to mention, I mean, I don't want to gloss over this. We put up three names there, right? <laughs> Cam Coleman and LJ McCray and Jeremiah Beeman. All three of those guys are in the top 247. But how about Cam Coleman? We talked about Cam Coleman from the state of Alabama, Phoenix City Central, that the fit there for him, we thought was Auburn. 
right? And you think about what Hugh Freeze has done at the receiver position. You go back to his time at Ole Miss. You think about guys like DK Metcalf, A.J. Brown, big, physical, strong receivers, guys with a lot of developmental upside. I think he fits there. And Drew, why I'm thinking about it, what about Auburn for Dante Moore if he ends, ends up hitting the portal, right? They don't have their long-term answer yet. We love Walker White, but he's a ways away. So we'll see if Auburn's going to be active there as well. Interesting spot. Hugh Freeze has done a really good job at the quarterback position. LJ McCray, though, Drew, how big would that one be if Auburn was going to find a way to get that one done? Yeah, pairing him opposite of Keldrick Falk. I think the other thing that stands out about Auburn's recruiting class right now with, what, six weeks to go before the early signing period is who they have gone head-to-head with. Perry Thompson, five-star wide receiver, big body frame. You want to talk about a DK Metcalf mold. Perry Thompson looks just like that. We kind of call him a man-child. Well, they beat out Alabama for him. Then you got uh, Joseph Phillips, uh, Demarcus Riddick. Those were two front seven defenders that Georgia was in heavy on. Auburn got that. Uh, And then they've already beat Florida for Jamonte Waller. So we'll see what else they can pry away. But again, I think times are good right now at Auburn. And I think they're going to have an exciting finish like we saw last cycle. And I think that's going to parlay into the transfer portal as well. We'll keep an eye on Auburn down the stretch. Certainly one of the hottest teams this time of year. But Drew, the other thing, it's not Christmas yet. It's not even Thanksgiving (laughs) But it's Mary Flipmas season. It is starting to happen and starting now. How about Texas getting in on the action with top 247 cornerback from New Orleans, John Aaron High School, Wardell Mack, the number 20 corner in the country. They snatch him away from Florida. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. But the Longhorns, Drew, quietly move up to number nine in the 24-7 sports composite team rankings after adding Mack and Ryan Wingo. That will certainly help. Drew, Longhorns also got Derek Williams out of Louisiana last year. I think that's noteworthy. Oh, and a guy by the name of Arch Manning, too. Doing some work in Louisiana, Steve Sarkeesian is. Coop, I got a question for you. Does every defensive back in the boot, they also play quarterback in some type of variety? I've been watching a ton of DBs as late, uh, and all these guys seem to go both ways, and they seem to touch the football a lot, whether it be as a Wildcat quarterback or a run-first quarterback. It just seems to be kind of the M.O. there in Louisiana. Is that is that accurate? That seems about right. Yeah. Every time you, you turn on, especially in New Orleans, those guys are doing a little bit of everything. But big pickup, nonetheless, Pete Kukowski, Steve yeah. Skarkeesian. We love that pickup for Texas. Texas right now, I think another one of those teams we probably need to watch down the stretch. All right, Drew, let's get in the weeds a little bit. How about this? Arizona, they flipped three-star athlete Dylan Tapley from Kenny Dillingham in Arizona State, the number 68 athlete in the country. Drew, you and I, different sides of the aisle on what we think he can be. 6'4", 205 pounds. This guy's pretty intriguing. I think we'll both agree on that. I like the upside here. I like this get for Jed Fish and company. Yeah, and they and they pulled him away from Arizona State, right? So your in-state rival. I'll tell you what Arizona thinks of him. They think he is a big F, right? So is he a tight end? Is he a slot receiver? They think he's just a guy where you can get creative with your personnel, right? And Jed Fish comes from the NFL. This is a guy that has an NFL offensive mind. He understands how to create mismatches, and I think they're expecting to do the same with Dylan Tapley, Uh, As a senior at Desert Mountain there in Arizona, 40 catches, 592 yards, nine touchdowns. He reminds me a little of a Will Mallory who was at the University of Miami, now with the Indianapolis Colts, uh, a guy that can stretch the field a a little bit and you can get creative with. So I like this pickup. You think about Arizona's recruiting class. I also got DeMond Williams in the boat. I know it's ranked, I think, 41 overall right now. So you kind of have to have a trained eye to look for the guys, but uh, this is a low-key pickup, and I would not be surprised if he's making some plays in that new look Big 12. Arizona is a sneaky talent ID program. Would you? Wouldn't you say that? I mean, they do a good job, yeah. uh, and they've certainly benefit benefited in the first couple of years under Jed Fish. Drew, the name for me on the comp here for Dylan Tapley, Kyle Casper. Hasn't yet to see the field really at Oregon, a guy that we had in the top 247, a reclass that you wrote about a little bit earlier in the year, basketball background, was a leaper. A little bit of that. So Kyle Casper, Will Mallory, get the idea. Big guy that can stretch the field, especially vertically. All right, Drew, let's go to the running back position. Three-star running back Jason Patterson, the number 25 running back in the country out of the state of Florida, flips from Cincinnati to Kentucky. You want to talk about programs that know a thing or two about identifying talent. Kentucky very quietly drew in the top 20 of the 
24-7 sports composite team rankings. And how about Jason Patterson? He's got a 10 9 700 meter to his name. Also, as a junior, he rushed for 2,700 rushing yards. He's down to 112 uh, plus this year, but uh, certainly a guy that doesn't lack production at all. Yeah, Coop, I thought you were going to ask if he was in my backyard. He is not. <laughs> I had to look up where Sneeds is. It is up almost on the Florida-Georgia border. I think he was going to be a steal for Cincinnati. And I talked with a few different staff members there. They were hoping he would fly under the radar. Kentucky sniffs him out, gets the job done. And, Cooper, I had written down exactly what you said, right? Kentucky right now, number 20 in the recruiting class rankings. Mark Stoops, his name continues to get linked to all these job openings, and it's usually followed up, well, hey, is he going to be able to recruit at a big level? Right now, Kentucky is doing an excellent job of you know, recruiting to what they want to be. They want to run the football, and then they really want to be good in that front seven. I love the defensive class Kentucky has committed right now. I think there's a ton of potential difference makers in there, some guys that could be all SEC caliber, guys you're going to see on those PFF lists. But Mark Stoops, excellent pickup uh, in Patterson, who's been one of the most productive players in the Sunshine State the past two cycles. He, too, has also played a little bit of quarterback, and he can score on the hardwood. So checks off box after box. And I'll finish with this. Kentucky, they had a running back committed, Tovani Mizell, out for the season with a knee injury. So they needed to get another guy in the fold. And I think Jaden Patterson, one of the better running backs in the South this year. Shout out to Mark Stoops, Big Blue. They know a, a thing or two about running back recruiting. All right, Drew, a couple big names here that we're going to highlight here on the transaction uh, wire. Top 247 corner, Kai Bates. Formerly committed to LSU, he is now off the board and back on the market, the number 104 player in the top 247, number nine corner. And Drew, I know a guy that you are a big fan of. It seems right now Florida State is taking a big swing at the Sunshine State product. Yeah, Kai Bates was in Tallahassee over the weekend, according to the guys at Knowles 247. I've I put out some feelers out there. You know, I'm not the big scoop guy anymore, but it seems like Kai Bates is in no rush to make a decision here. And I think for Kai, it's a smart play, right? The coaching carousel is spinning now. We're going to see new hires, new staffs in place. I think his option list is only going to expand. I was, was in Orlando two months ago. Got to see Kai and his Orlando Edgewater team take on Orlando Jones. Kai had two interceptions that game. Uh, and Coop, I think a lot of us forget when we're scouting Kai Bates. This is a kid that's only playing playing defense for two seasons now. He's a former wide receiver turned pass defender. I know you're a big fan as well. And I think this is a blow for LSU, right? We continue to talk about that defense, that secondary, giving up a ton of yardage. Kai Bates, I don't think he would have been ready to go day one, uh, year one, year two. But I think long term, the developmental upside, he is a monster ceiling. Yeah, LSU in a uh, little bit of a tough spot right now, I think, with that defensive back room. We'll see what happens with corners coach Robert Steeples. You talk about Kai Bates, Andre Evans, also another top 247 corner. He flipped to Georgia a couple weeks ago as well. So LSU still looking to get a couple bodies in there in their defensive back room. Drew, Florida State, though, right now in the top five. Mike Norvell uh, certainly going to reach uh, the height of high school recruiting in Tallahassee uh, so far in his tenure. They are swinging down the stretch here, uh, Drew. How about this? Josiah Trader, Kai Bates. You think about Zay Mincy, LJ McCray, Cameron Coleman as well, Jeremiah Smith, the number one player in the country. You want to talk about teams that got a chance to really do some things down the stretch. How about Florida State? Yeah, it hasn't felt like this in a while where they could, you know, really add some fireworks come signing day. Uh, I mean, what, two years ago they lost Travis Hunter to Jackson State and, and, and Coach Prime, who's and obviously they're now at Colorado. But usually the big names have come via the transfer portal. That is not the case here for Florida State, and it's kind of been impressive or fun to watch how this class has come together. I mean, Luke Cromanhawk, remember, he's a guy they took a commitment from before he had even started a high school game, and obviously we're talking about the quarterback commit. You know, they were in on a lot of guys early, got the bulk of that class in place, and I think they set themselves up for a situation where it's like, hey, if we have a good season, the runway is there to really go after some blue chippers, some guys that are at the top of our board. They had a wish list. They didn't know if it was going to be obtainable. Well, now you're 10-0 and 0, uh, in the college football playoff conversation, and you can go after those guys. Let's go from one talent-rich state to another. Now from Florida 
to Idaho, where top 247 receiver Gatlin Bear resides, the number nine receiver in the country, number 35 player overall, Drew. An interesting recruitment, to say the least. This is a guy that will go on his mission before he suits up and plays some college football. He's also been committed to Boise State in the Broncos, but in case you've been under a rock, Andy Avalos, the head coach, is out after a couple years there in Boise. We'll see what happens there. But Drew, a couple other contenders earlier in the recruitment, now starting to reemerge. Oregon, Dan Lanning and the Danimal certainly got his fork and knife out. And then you got Jim Harbaugh and the Michigan Wolverines, who have actually done a pretty good job there in Idaho in years past. Drew, this is one of the, uh, I would say, recruitments in top 50 players that is probably overlooked the most. I think a lot of that probably has to do with geography, but Gatlin Bear is a stud. I absolutely love what he's put on tape as a senior two-way prospect, going to play receiver at the next level. If you don't know anything about him, track and field background, 10-1-8 in the 100 meter, he can absolutely roll. Drew, how big of a pickup would this be for Oregon if they were able to get this one done? Do you remember back in when, when did Gatlin announced? Was it back in June or July? We had to do those segments or, or those hits about, hey, where where is the perfect fit for Gatlin Bear? Where did you side? Because I know I thought Michigan player development. Uh, we're talking about a guy that's again going to go on a mission. And Gatlin Bear comes from an athletic family, right? He's got two brothers that run track. Uh, went off on missions. He told me when I was writing him up for the freaks list that one of the brothers actually left, went on a mission, right? How he trained was dunking on a basketball court. I think it was in Mexico. Actually trimmed his 100-meter dash time down while he was gone away. So Gatlin Bear, uh, we talked at length about what he plans to do to maintain that speed when he leaves uh, football for six, eight months, up to a year. Seems like he has a plan in place. I've always thought Michigan makes the most sense, but I do think Oregon is kind of the one to watch here. Given the season they've had, what Dan Lanning's doing, um, and just the talent they've been able to add. It seems like when Dan Lanning sees an opportunity, he seizes it. Yeah, we'll see what happens with Gatlin Bear over the next couple of weeks. If you want to keep up with that recruitment for uh, an Oregon fan, a Boise fan, a Michigan fan, whatever you are, you're just interested in Gatlin Bear, be sure to follow Brandon Huffman, one of the best in the business, breaking down everything with Gatlin Bear over the next couple of weeks. Hey, hey Coop, Coop, if, if I'm the first, that's the first guy, if I take over at Mississippi State, that's who I'm calling, right? We had that on yesterday's show. Who do you call if you take over at Mississippi State? Well, look, I just told you Gatlin Bear has a tie to the Bulldogs. I'm making that call right there. Idaho to Mississippi, man. It just makes too much sense, you know. <laughs> All right, Drew, let's talk about Billy Napier and the Florida Gators. Five and five on the field. Tough game against LSU. We talked about it yesterday. We actually thought they played well enough to win that game. Jaden Daniels was just too much in that spot. Florida still has a top five ranked recruiting class and Drew, you mentioned it. It's been tough to kind of hang on to some of these guys down the stretch. Jamonte Waller, one of those guys that was formerly committed. Uh, he commits to Auburn. We talked about him earlier in the show. Wardell Mack to Texas, another top 247 prospect as well. Drew, a couple of the guys here, and I just got news as we pre-record this earlier in the day. Top 247 defensive lineman, Naj Johnson. Mary Flitmas, he is off to Georgia. So now that defensive line room that is one of the best in the country that we have praised earlier in the year, you got guys like Nas Johnson, he's off to Georgia. LJ McCray, suitors like Auburn, Florida State still coming after him. And Amaris Williams just took an OV to Ohio State, right? So there is a lot going on right now. We also talked about DJ Lagway, what would happen if A&M ends up getting the right guy. Drew, Florida ends the season with Mizzou, and Florida State. And if they go 0-2, I think it's fair to question, we don't know what's going to happen with Billy Napier. I think you and I both agree that he should get year three, but it's a very real possibility that Florida is not bowl eligible this year. And if that is not the case, I mean, you talk about a class ripe for the taking that I think a lot of people are circling right now, and they're going to wonder what's going on with Billy Napier over the next couple of weeks because Florida certainly lacks no shortage of talent in this 2024 recruiting class. Well, Coop, you've been on the college side. I mean, if you're in Billy Napier or one of his army of staff members situation, like, how are you handling this? What are you telling kids right now? Um, <laughs> you know, what is the message that you're you're telling them on the? Because I'm fascinated to hear what you would say. I, I think for me, Florida, they're going to have to probably pivot to some Plan Bs, and I think knowing what Billy Napier has done, you want to talk about talent identification, right? 
they have hit on some guys. They've been in early on some guys. So for me, let's say Billy Napier, you know, Florida closes it out with two losses. They finish five and seven. Uh, I, I think some of these guys are going to defect and they're going to have to fill in. And, and the guys that they fill in with are going to have to be potential, you know, multi-year contributors in the SEC. And then what are they going to do in the transfer portal? Because they hit on Graham Mertz, but they also missed on some guys last cycle and they were not super active. So number one, you know, what, are, what are you telling guys if you're in that seat? Trust the process, right? That was a slogan at Alabama when I was there in 2014. Billy Napier was a receivers coach. And all Billy Napier has been about since he has been at Florida has been about trusting the process. And that needs to continue to be the message. Anything that happens from this point forward to Billy Napier outside of what happens on a football field – is out of his control. It's out of, outside of the control of every member of that staff, whether you're a coach, whether you're a member of the support staff. So same language equals force multiplier. I say that a lot. That means everybody's got to be speaking the same language, and the message has to be strong, and it's got to be a united front. And guys like DJ Lagway, they got to hear that, right? Whether we're 5-7 and seven or whether we win the next two or split the next two, we're still going forward with our plan. And Billy Napier, to his credit, he's had a plan. And he's pitched this. Now, the results over the last two years are uh, they're fair to criticize, right? I think any Florida fan would. I think there's a lot of question marks in terms of what's to be desired on the field. Drew, in terms of off the field, what they've done in two years, I love, which almost makes me think, like, we got to see some results year three, but year three – is the year that you circle for Billy Napier, and we got to see what happens. It was the same thing with Mike Norvell that you and I used to talk about a couple years ago. What happens with Mike Norvell going into year three? He rewards that fan base there in Tallahassee, and guess what? I think he's like 21-3 and three since, right? So we'll see what happens with Florida Drew. I'll say this. Even if Billy Napier doesn't get fired, I think we're going to see a couple defections as well. Yeah, it, it's going to be I – mean, all right, who's the guy they got to hold on to? For me, it's DJ Lagway, but you can't can't pick DJ Lagway, right? We've seen Nas Johnson go, Wardell Mack go. Who Who's the one they got to stick with? I, I think it's Amarius Williams, the defensive lineman out of North Carolina. You know he's a favorite of ours. Well, I, they got to keep him in the fold. I'm going to go with McCray. I think they worked hard to, to get the inside slant on him. He's a five-star. He's a guy ranked inside the top ten, the biggest riser for us. You want to build this identity – on the defensive side of the line of scrimmage. And right now, you are super vulnerable, but you have some guys playing well on that side of the football, especially guys like Kelby Collins, right, that you're banking on. They've done a good job there. they got to keep these guys in the boat. The L.J. McCray one, Drew, if they lose that one, that's going to take a lot of wind out of their sails. So we'll see what happens with Florida. But D.J. Lagway, I think that goes without saying. That's a guy that they're kind of hitching their wagon to for the foreseeable future. But on the defensive side, I think you could say the same thing about LJ McCray. So Florida right now leaking. They got to find a way to kind of patch it up, keep it together over the next couple of weeks. And we'll see what happens with a couple big matchups for Billy Napier down the stretch. All right, Drew, little no huddle here. A couple 2025 starting to fly off the board too. So we're going to keep you updated with that. About top 247 and top 32 ranked prospect. And the number 22 ranked prospect in the class of 2025, Zion Grady out of the state of Alabama. He pops to, guess where? Alabama, the Dark Lord on Sunday. Bama ranked number one in 2025. Drew, he's 72 years old, uh, but like we always say, I don't think he's slowing down at all. Yeah, and Alabama now with the number one ranked class in the 2025 cycle. They overtake Georgia with Grady's commitment on Sunday. I mean, this is one of the better pure pass rushers we've come across so far in that cycle. He's a finesse player. He's got the speed. Uh, we've kind of labeled him as a tweener, but we were just talking about it. What Wednesday on our group call, he's actually, you know, six, three and a quarter, uh, 225 pounds. He's got some, some longer arms and, and exceptional jump numbers. And he's a guy that also plays basketball. So like this pickup, uh, Alabama, they have a ton of offensive firepower in that 2025 class. Zion Grady is the guy that stands out for me on defense. Be careful with that tweener tag, my friend. You might uh, offend somebody there. I remember I called uh, Ruben Bain a tweener. He lines up all over the place, and I guess you can't be a good player tweener. if you're a tweener, but whatever. Tweeners are in, all right? <laughs> tweeners tweeners are, are in. Tweeners are in right now. <laughs> Three-star quarterback Carter Smith, the number 14 quarterback in the country out of the state of Florida, off the board to Michigan. On Tuesday, Drew, Michigan, along with Colorado, Penn State, LSU, 
Why is this important? Well, Carter Smith's a good player. We're going to break him down. But they're all in the mix for the number one quarterback in the land in 2025, quarterback Bryce Underwood. But first, Drew, what do you think about this pickup, Carter Smith, to Michigan? Yeah, I have had some exposure to. Saw him throw at Miami's legend camp back in June. Uh, a bit unorthodox with the release. And he's a guy with a baseball background. I mean, he is really athletic. You'll see it. He's ran for over 1,000 yards. He's going to be a four-year starter at Bishop Barrow over in Fort Myers. I think he's excellent on the RPOs. But for a baseball kid, there are times I feel like the ball dies a little bit. With that being said, I mean, he is over six foot three. He's got a wiry athletic frame. I like it if you're Michigan developmental quarterback tank. Uh, but I do think it's interesting, Cooper, right? They got Jaden Davis committed in 2023, who's having a heck of a senior season, right? I think we think he is a higher floor prospect. Don't know how high the ceiling is. Now, Steve Wilfong, director of recruiting at 24-7 Sports, he said Michigan could end up taking two quarterbacks in 2025. And I just found that interesting. I, guess, I, I Does that keep the door open for Bryce Underwood, the, the number one ranked quarterback in 2025, or do you think they're really just going to try to take two guys? No, I think that um, I think that a couple of these programs, like I, I don't think it's a coincidence, right? You think of everybody involved in the Bryce Underwood sweepstakes. You look at Colorado, they took Antoine Hill, another top 247 quarterback in 2025. Penn State just took Beckham Kritzer. We're going to talk about him here in a second. He just came off the board yesterday. And then you got Michigan with Carter Smith, right, that they take from Florida. It's a delicate dance when it comes to quarterbacks, and especially when you're kind of playing musical chairs there. Bryce Underwood, his latest visit, I believe, was to LSU in Baton Rouge. Joe Sloan, friend of the pod. They've done a really good job with him, the quarterback coach down at LSU. I think these guys are kind of hedging their bets a little bit. And I think, listen, if, if you're Michigan – the message out of there is we're taking to Bryce Underwood's not going anywhere. Why wouldn't you say that? Why wouldn't you say that if you're Deion Sanders at Colorado or James Franklin at Penn State? But right now, to me, Drew, if I'm just reading the tea leaves, it kind of seems like LSU with a January decision for Bryce Underwood is sitting in the driver's spot for the best quarterback in the country and arguably one of the best players in the country. So that's kind of what I see. It's kind of starting to get to that time. we got, what, a month and a half until he comes off the board. I kind of like where LSU's sitting right now. All right, go fire in that crystal ball pick. I only have one crystal ball. It was Jaden Rashad into Miami. It happened, and then it didn't. So, yeah, maybe number two will uh, be Bryce Underwood. All right, Drew, Beckham Kritzo, we just talked about him. He's kind of been all over the place throughout his high school career. It was at Miami Central, now out in Colorado, number 34 quarterback in the country, commits to Penn State. On Tuesday, it's Wednesday, sorry, I got mixed up there, on the 24-7 Sports YouTube channel. Drew, 6'5 and a half, 180 pounds. He's completing over 65% of his passing attempts this season. I, I, this is not a guy that we haven't seen since his freshman year. 20 touchdowns, three INTs, and six games played this season. That is his most updated stat line. Drew, what do you think about Beckham Kritza to Penn State right after Mike Yurcich departs last week, his offense coordinator position? I think it's a head scratcher to me um, because – Penn State was involved with plenty of 2025 signal callers. I mean, Bryce Underwood was at the whiteout game. They had a few other individuals in the stands. Ryan Montgomery, Malik Washington on Saturday for the loss to Michigan. This just feels rushed. I don't know who twisted whose arm here, but you don't have an OC, right? I What, what is the hurry to take him? And who was going to take Beckham Kritza? Colorado's already got their quarterback. We mentioned them. Texas A&M doesn't have a head coach. Miami can't even figure out what they're doing on the field right now at the quarterback position. I mean, who was really pushing for Beckham Kritza? Just feels a little bit weird to me. I mean, as a, the prospect, he's a guy, Cooper, you also forgot out he was in Colorado, or excuse me, California for a year, spent last season backing up Jackson Potter, Washington State signee. I, I don't know. I, I saw him throw in the summer months down here in Miami-Dade, he spent some time at Miami Central. They thought he might be the starting quarterback, and he was not the starting quarterback. Ask, asked some of the coaches there, and they just kind of told me he wasn't it. Um, that doesn't mean he can't be it for someone else, but at one of the most uh, you know storied programs in South Florida, Beckham Kritza wasn't able to crack the starting lineup. And I've seen him throw. I think he's got some raw tools. He just needs some polish so interested to see how this plays out I think there's going to be more shuffling with Penn State when it comes to the quarterback position once they hire an OC I, I've never understood why why take a player at a position where you don't have a position coach 
in a coordinator, right? It, it doesn't make a lot of sense there. Obviously, Mike Yurcich out last week at Penn State after the Michigan game. Drew, the other thing about this is Penn State has been really, really strong when it comes to quarterback identification and evaluation. Drew Aller, the number one quarterback in 2022, but after that, Jackson Smolik, we talked about on this show, another guy that was a late riser for us in 23. And then in 24, you got Ethan Gronkemeyer out of the state of Ohio, who's having a great year there at Olin Tangy. So I think they've done a really good job. You got to give Yursich a lot of credit. As soon as he leaves, they take a 25 signal caller, a guy that's uh, had a little bit of a, a, a checkered start to his high school career. We'll see what happens there, but definitely interesting as well. I think well traveled would be the word that you can throw in that scouting scouting report. Well traveled, well traveled. Four high schools, there, there, three years. There you go. All right, guys. Like I said, busy month ahead, starting December fourth. The transfer portal palooza. We'll have coverage here at twenty four seven Sports, and also welcoming Matt Zenitz. What an addition coming over to twenty four seven Sports national reporter. Make sure to follow him. Also, National Signing Day, December twentieth. We'll have coverage from Florida and Fort Lauderdale, also in Nashville, coast to coast, with our great team here at 24-7 Sports. So make sure you keep it locked and put that on your calendar over the next month. And with that being said, it is time for a vibe check, hang loose, throw the shakas up, whatever it is. And we're going to bring in our friend Mike Roach. Papa Roach, you are not our last resort. You are our first resort, my friend, for everything Texas football, and we are ready to dive into it. So I'm going to throw you a toss-up. I know right now your kid is driving you crazy. You got a lot of things going on, so we're going to start out nice and slow. How about this? Super vague question. Mike Roach, what went wrong with Jimbo Fisher at Texas A&M? <laughs> uh, I don't know if you can point to one thing. I would say I, I, if I had to point to one thing, I think uh, two things, actually. The, the stubbornness to stick with his offensive system. Um, when for years people were telling him that he needed to hire an offensive coordinator. He did it this year, but uh, I, I think it was a little too late. And then I would say his staff hires. After, I, I think his initial staff in College Station was a good staff, but he lost Josh Henson to USC. He lost uh, Mike Elko to Duke. And he replaced those guys with, with DJ Durkin, who's had some mixed results, and Steve Adazio, who I would say has had some poor results on the, you know, as far as feedback on the recruiting trail. And then obviously when you look at the development of their offensive line, it's led to some quarterback injuries and things like that. So um, I think those were definitely it. I, I do think that, you know, when you, when you have these older coaches, especially guys with a, with a great track record of success, they're stuck in their ways a little bit. It's a little harder to get them to adapt uh, the way college football is adapting. And I think that was probably his biggest issue. Mike, a name we've seen linked to that Texas A&M opening, Jeff Trailer. I know you're super familiar with him, head coach at UTSA. I've seen that operation up front and in person. They came down to Boca Raton, smacked my owls in the trenches. I got to see that firsthand a few weeks ago. Uh, number one, what makes Jeff Trailer who he is? Because anyone that's ever been around him, raves about the guy and where do you think he'd be a fit is it texas a&m or do you have your eye on some other potential openings or i guess what are you hearing in the lone star state when it comes to jeff trailer well when you look at jeff trailer i guess if he had a player card right it would say he's a high school coach a former high school coach at gilmer high school in east texas who has great relationships with the high school coaches in texas and that's kind of where everybody think it thinks it ends but Jeff Trailer, while at Gilmer, was one of the more innovative offensive minds in the state of Texas in high school football. That transitioned over. He worked under Charlie Strong's uh, uh, staff at Texas. He worked with Chad Morris at SMU in Arkansas uh, before getting the UTSA job. He's a guy that wins. I mean, he's a culture builder. He is a fiery leader, but he is also a very good offensive mind. When you think about this, in the last couple of years, he's lost his two offensive coordinators, Barry Lenny Jr. to Illinois, Will Stein to Oregon. They've kept up their offensive success even through all that transition. They lost Zachary Franklin, their all-time leading receiver, to Ole Miss via the transfer portal. They kept up their offensive success. He came into UTSA, a program that before him, uh, I believe, had won 41 games and had three winning seasons. Since he's been there, he's won 37 games and he's had four winning seasons. So this is a guy that wins everywhere he's been. He's an incredible relationship builder. Uh, I mean, people talk glowingly about him because if you spend five minutes in a room with him, you feel like you've known him forever. He's a, kind of as real as it gets. And I, I think he's a fit 
certainly anywhere in the state of Texas. I think he's, he could be successful wherever he is because he understands kind of what leads to his success, understanding that he's done all of this at UTSA with little to no resources, no money for NIL, no real support staff. I think if you put him at a program where you, you gave him some resources, I, I couldn't imagine where he could go with it. Mike, we're going to go in the uh, – Cooper calls it in the weeds here. This is a candidate that uh, – a, co- a potential coaching candidate that I haven't seen linked to a lot of jobs, but you're familiar with him. Uh, I would not be surprised as this – coaching carousel keeps spinning his name comes up and that's dj kenny uh head coach at texas state uh a guy that has made his rise rapidly through the rankings uh, just can you provide some insight on him do you think he's ready to jump maybe from a group of five program to the potentially a power five and, and for those not familiar he was at ucf and card word now he's at texas state and he has what are they the bobcats six and four yeah. in his first season yeah, and uh, it's it's fitting we transition to him. G.J. Kenny was Jeff Trailer's quarterback at Gilmer. Um, the two are extremely close. They, you know, G.J. considers Jeff Trailer like a father, and he's kind of made that quick ascent at the college football world. Did it at Incarnate Word, turning Lindsey Scott, a guy disregarded by most of college football, into one of the best FCS quarterbacks out there, and then w- has been able to turn. Uh, uh, I'm blanking on the name of their quarterback, T.J. Uh, Finley. Uh, the former Auburn quarterback, he's, he's turned him into a player. And so they've been able to put together a really strong offense. Um, they've recruited Texas well. It was a big point of emphasis because the previous staff felt that they could primarily build their roster out of the transfer portal and ignored the state of Texas in recruiting. G.J. Kinney, when he came back in, his mission was to take back Texas. I mean, it's it, it, there's not a long resume to go on, right? But I do think that... He has proven early on from a roster management standpoint and from just success on the field that he does kind of get it and he is headed up. I think two potential uh, spots to look at in the state of Texas that could open this offseason, Baylor and Houston. I think that he and Jeff Trailer both would be candidates for both of those jobs. Um, I'm, I'm kind of interested with Arkansas, if Arkansas opened up, would they – Look into Kenny. He's an East Texas guy. East Texas kind of flows right into Arkansas. There's a lot of Arkansas influence in that area. I I I certainly think he's going to be in the mix. I maybe maybe schools will want to see a little more success from him at Texas State, a little more sustained success. But I do think he's a guy that you're going to see interview for some of those jobs. Love the fit for Kenny in Houston. You mentioned that as well. Baylor, another program I think makes a lot of sense for Jeff Trailer. We'll see what happens if those two programs do in fact open up. Mike, I want to uh, transition from the coaching carousel now to recruiting, but we'll stay in the state of Texas. Let's talk about five-star safety and the number two safety in all of the land in the 2024 class. How about Xavier Phil Same? He's been a, a busy guy lately. USC in the picture, Texas in the picture. We talked about Florida and the finish that they have in front of them, five and five. They are fighting for bowl eligibility right now. What's the latest on Xavier Phil Same? Well, Xavier Phils to me out of McKinney High School has been, uh, he's kind of kept it quiet since recru- uh, committing to Florida back in the spring. But I think that he's evaluating some options. I do think right now, after talking to him uh, last week, talking to some people around him, he is still firmly committed to Florida, but I think he wants to have a backup option in case something were to happen to Billy Napier and that coaching staff. Um, you know, Florida wasn't an obvious contender for him when he committed there. It was kind of the last visit on the spring tour he was making. And he went there and was just completely off guard, surprised and pleasantly surprised by what Florida had to offer and, and the relationships he was able to build there. So I don't think he wants to come off that commitment easily. Went to USC. I think he did, you know, kids tend to love California. Shocker, Southern California is uh, cool on, on official visits. And uh, Texas has been trying to get him back on campus. He's set to be back at, in Gainesville for the Florida State game. The school I would actually say to watch in this one that can potentially make a run at him from talking to people around him is Oregon. Um, they've re- kind of remained in contact. He, he's talked about wanting to get back up to Oregon if he can this season. But McKinney's in the in the heat of their playoff run. And, and here in Texas, you know, when, the, when it shifts to playoff times and you get into the later rounds, those games are typically on Saturday. So it's going to make visits a little harder for him. Um, we'll see. I, I know he he doesn't want to drag it out because he is in, uh, planning to enroll early. But I think as long as Billy Napier and his staff are intact, he ends up at Florida. But like I said, I would I would circle Oregon as one to watch there. 
Cooper, you hear that organ? <laughs> I feel like we did this last year with Peyton Bowen, right? I mean, they're just out there right now, especially in Texas. They're making some inroads over there, Mike. I, I mean, yeah, they've dude, done a if, good if, job. If, got, I mean, Will Stein, who I talked about earlier, is on their staff. He's a, a guy that coached at Lake Travis High School here before being at UTSA. Drew Maringer's on their, their tight ends coach, is a, is a former t- Texas high school football player who's, uh, who coached at Texas under Tom Herman. So they've got some, some ties to the area. Mike, what about Draylon Miller, number 14 wide receiver for us? I believe he was just at LSU over the weekend. LSU seems to be trying to get it back to wide receiver U. Um, just the latest with him. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, I feel like LSU has, has been kind of the the one to watch here. Um, I, I since he decommitted from Texas A&M, but Colorado has also been in the mix as well. Um, he went to to Boulder a couple of weeks ago. Uh, really raved about that visit and and the experience. One school that I think could 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 make it interesting, depending on how hard they pursue him, is Texas. Texas has largely ignored him throughout the recruiting cycle, and there's been a little more contact in that area. I think that if they really start to push, we could see Steve Sarkeesian and his program make a strong push down the stretch for him. He's, from what I understand, has always kind of grown up liking Texas. That's been the school he's had circled. Um, I think had they pushed early on, he'd be in this class already. And so we'll see if if, uh, some applied pressure on the way to signing day can get that done for Texas. It would be exciting to pair him with Jarrett Gibson, uh, Ryan Wingo, Brandon Baker, Colin Simmons. I mean, that Texas class a month ago, we're wondering where's the star power shooting up the rankings and and getting guys that, you know, could all be starters at the position. Uh, Kobe Black, you mentioned the Longhorns, number four safety. Anything new on him as we are approaching the early signing period? Yeah, I actually just talked to a source about Kobe Black right before I hopped on here. Um, it's I, I think this recruitment is winding down. I think we are nearing a decision um, within the next month. Uh, Texas has long been the favorite. Uh, they've got my crystal ball. They'll continue to have my crystal ball as of right now. I think A&M was making a really strong push, but obviously, you know, firing your head coach kind of throws a little speed bump into that. Oklahoma State is an interesting one to watch. Kobe's brother, Corey Black, is, is having a really good season for Oklahoma State. Kobe has been to a ton of games in Stillwater this year to go see him. And they're really leaning on that family angle. I, I'm interested to see if they can kind of close the distance between Texas uh, down the stretch. Those are the three schools I'm hearing the most about right now with Kobe Black. Mike, we'll get you out on a 2025, one of the best players in the country, a number seven player in the country, currently a number two cornerback. That is Devin Sanchez out of the North Shore and a guy that's got a lot of fans here at 24-7 Sports. <laughs> He's going to make an announcement at the All-American Bowl. What's the latest with him? You know, I, I never try to be uh, I try to be hyperbolic about guys. I always try to like uh, let a take set in. But I was thinking the other day, I think he's the best cornerback I've covered in in my career. He's he's really really good. Um, I think Ohio State has long been the leader, and Devin has talked openly about that. I've I've done three or four interviews with him in the last six months, where he's just said, "Yeah, Ohio State's my leader." I mean, that's that's who it is. Alabama A and M was was in there. I, you know, we'll see how much the Jimbo Fisher thing affects that. But I think this comes down to Alabama and Ohio State. It's interesting to see if Alabama can make a push uh, down the stretch heading into this. But with a commitment date in mind, I would lean heavily towards Ohio State. That's where I've got my crystal ball. And it's it's really the duo there of of Coach Walton and Coach Eliano that have that have leaned on him and, and the guys they've developed, the guy and the relationships they've built. He's talked a lot about how he watches the DBs that the coaches who are, who are recruiting him have developed and what they can do on the field. He's a big fan of Sauce Gardner, who isn't, um, and and he's he really likes that potential of, of how they can develop him. Mike Roach, we appreciate you, man, as always. If you want to look for Mike Roach's work, you can find him at Mike Roach 247 on Twitter. Mike Roach, what, coaching carousel, breaking down recruitment, state of Texas, the aficionado. Mike Roach, we appreciate you coming on. Drew, how about that, man? Some loaded scoop there. Draylon Miller, the Texas. You know what popped into my mind about the Draylon Miller thing is he kind of reminds me a little bit of Jordan Whittington coming out, right? And that's a guy that they're going to have to replace after this season. Played a little bit of running back out of high school. A guy that they can move around playing the slot. Super versatile. 
And what a luxury for Texas that you can show up in the 11th hour and just be, hey, you want to throw on the burn orange, you know, and uh, burn LSU and everybody else to come play for us. But Mike Roach, man, Xavier feels same as well. How about that? Oregon creeping around? <laughs> Oregon, man. Like Dan Lanning is going to – prime – needed 65 roster spots like Dan Lanning could actually fill 65 roster spots with like dudes right not backups from other schools and I think the other thing that stood out about Roach Devin Sanchez Ohio State right we're going through the 2025 rankings right now it's still super early we feel really good about Devin Sanchez we like their quarterback commit Tavian St. Clair and then they got Blake Woodby committed DB out of the DMV like I, I'm bullish on him a little undersized but man That'd be quite the start. And then they got Javon Bogues or Boggs from, from Cocoa Beach. I mean, that would be a heck of a start for the Buckeyes and Ryan Day on the trail in that 25 cycle. For as good and as robust of a recruiting operation that Ohio State has, they don't get enough credit for how good they are when it comes to early talent identification. I think Mark Pantone, his staff, some of the best in the country. And if you're wondering when the All-American Bowl is, that's on January 6th. 2024. I can't even believe that, but right around the corner. So Devin Sanchez, one of the best players in the country. That's where he'll make his commitment. Guys, I hope you enjoyed it. Another great week for the Oyster Boys. Before we get out of here, make sure to smash that subscribe button and that like button as well. For the director of scouting, Andrew Ivins, I'm Cooper Patagna. We'll see you next week. <laughs>